Hello YouTube. As you all know, I am a big believer in giant sets for hypertrophy and bodybuilding, and even supersets in general. And recently, Board Omniman said something about the topic that I disagree with 100%. And therefore, I wanted to wait in. It's nothing dramatic, it's just a difference of approach, a point of contention, if you will. But I think that it denotes a different approach in the way we train. And I think that's interesting to explore because it's going to give you more value. And it's going to also open your eyes to the difference in training between hypertrophy and strength. So, Bold Omniman said this about giant sets. There are a lot of instances where I feel like if your goals are strength, hypertrophy, or just overall performance, I don't feel like giant sets are a good idea. And I'm going to tell you why. When you're training for either strength or hypertrophy, there is a performance element to that. If you do giant sets, you're putting a bigger emphasis on the conditioning aspect of it, which is what I think they're good for in the time saving aspect of it, obviously. The first thing I notice is that Paris conflates strength and hypertrophy. And it's not surprising everyone does on this platform because people have been convinced that strength equals size. I know that his views are more nuanced, but what he said clearly points in that direction. And it's an issue because there are different pursuits entirely. And if we take the standpoint of strength, it makes a ton of sense. If someone told you, hey, if you want to be as strong as possible, train like a bodybuilder, you would laugh in their face. But it's been now 10 years where people tell you that if you want to get as big as possible, you must train like a strength athlete. And that makes just as little sense. Both practices and endeavors require performance, absolutely. But it's not the same type of performance for the reason I just explained. We'll get into that later. When Paris speaks about giant sets, he seems to believe that the goal of giant sets is to promote conditioning. And that is correct, but that's only one way to do giant set. It's one approach. There are many other approaches to giant set. The reason why people, him included, believe that this is the one is because of stereotypes. It's because of circuits. It's because you have this idea in your head of someone who runs across the gym to get as much done as possible, as fast as possible. That is not the proper way to do giant set. A giant set is like a superset. You're done with your exercise and you walk like a normal human being to your next exercise. It saves time and that is the point, but at no point is it supposed to make you ragged or make you out of breath. If it does, it means that one, you have no cardiovascular endurance at all, or two, that your pace is too elevated or the exercises you selected are poorly selected. The goal of the giant set is never to be limited by your cardiovascular endurance, but by your muscular endurance. So this is something that I wanted to point out because lumping every giant set in that bag of conditioning is a little bit disingenuous. I know that he didn't do that on purpose. It's simply that everyone thinks that's the way they function and that's simply not the case. What all giant sets have in common, however, is that they do save time. And Paris mentioned that. However, I don't think that he conveyed the importance of that one aspect. Time is your most valuable resource, especially as a bodybuilder. Every time you can save time and sneak some exercises into the program, that is a massive win because that is what bodybuilding performance relies on. Since as a bodybuilder, you try to accumulate as much quality tonnage as possible, as quickly as possible which of course is completely opposed to strength training. If you gave that definition of performance to a strength athlete like Paris, they would laugh in your face. And this is why he believes that giant sets are not super good. The issue in why I made this video is because, as I said, he lumped strength and hypertrophy together, saying that either for strength training or hypertrophy training, it wasn't good and I disagree. Now let's, let's listen to the second quote. If you're looking to get as strong as possible, you need to be giving as much attention to one exercise at a time so that you can put in your best performance and have adequate rest to be able to do that. As opposed to, okay, I'm gonna do squats and then kettlebell swings and then windshield wipers and then calves, and then I'm gonna rest. 
dude, you're gassed by the time you're doing those calf raises or whatever the heck you're doing at the last exercise for your giant set. So this sort of proves what I just said, and that is that Paris is mostly focused on strength. He's a strength athlete, one that is jacked as fuck, but still someone whose performance aspect is going to be more tailored towards strength. And it's something that is absolutely visible in the example that he gave where he spoke about the squats. In the way he presents the set, he is going to schedule it so as to be sure to be able to put all of the effort in one exercise at a time. And that, of course, raises performance. No one argues against that. In his example, he said that the opposite, the giant set counterpart of his approach would be doing, for example, squats plus kettlebell swings plus windshield wipers plus caps. That is absolutely a giant set. But it's a terrible giant set. I'm going to tell you exactly why. Even though you have the structure down, you are not respecting basic rules of giant set programming. Here, for example, the problem is that you are doing a heavy compound movement for the legs, followed by movements that also train the legs, and on top of that are going to damage your ability to practice the movement, aka being performant. Because you're doing arm strings and glutes with the kettlebell swings, you're doing abs that are required for rigidity in the core for squats, and you're doing calves, which I would argue don't do that much to your performance. But the issue is that he is correct here. If you run this, at the end of the giant set, you can rest as much as you want. It does not matter. You tired the muscles required in the squat, and therefore you will not be performant. Now, let's do a proper giant set the way I would program replace the movement like the kettlebell swing and the windshield wipers with things like curls and real delt isolation. And just like that, you are good. You are still doing a giant set, you are still accumulating tonnage, but you're not losing performance on the squat. I will get back to it. If you believe, and I'm sure that Paris does not, but if you watching me right now believe that training your biceps and your real delts after a squat is going to damage your performance, I don't know what to tell you. These are completely different muscle groups. Your body is not that weak that you would lose on performance. And if you don't believe me, please do attempt and come back. The only way it could is if you have such low cardiovascular endurance that you are stumped by that type of practice. And if that is the case, it is a sign that you need to fix it as fast as possible. I want to point out, however, that what Paris pointed out here is an example of strength work. Strength work is the one moment of the training of a bodybuilder, according to the way I program, or you will not be supersetting anything remotely heavy. For example, deadlifts, squat, I don't superset, or if I do, it's with neck or with calves, nothing else, and it's a superset, it's not a giant set. So his theory about lower body movement is absolutely on point. You want to preserve performance as much as possible. However, as a bodybuilder, that strength work will make up roughly 20% of your tonnage. It's super high quality tonnage. It's very important, but we only use that to push performance on the other lifts where 80% of the tonnage comes from. So it's perfectly fine to not giant set these lifts because this is not where most of our volume is going to come from. The other sets will absolutely be supersetted. And just to rebound on the gas comment, Paris said that if you ran that type of giant set, you would be gassed, and that's absolutely correct. Compound movement for the legs plus exercises of isolation, you will be out of breath. But if it's upper body, you will find that the damage is much lesser. And this is why you program lower body lifts in gentle giant sets as opposed to upper body. Look at any of my programs and look at the moments where I have you giant set a knee flexion or a hip hinge. It's always followed by movements that are easy on the cardiovascular system because I know you are pre-fatigued. Whereas if you open with an override press, I'm going to do movements afterwards that might require some tor torso movement like ab isolation because I know for a fact you can take it. This is all part of the plan. Now let's listen to the third quote by Paris. As opposed to, okay, I'm going to bang these squats out. Boom. Now, instead of just me being, you know, too tired to do a stiff leg deadlift and doing a kettlebell swing instead for my hip hinge, since I'm rested, I'm going to do stiff leg deadlifts. Okay, boom. Now I'm going to work my hamstrings because I'm not tired. And then I'm going to work my abs. You see what I'm saying? Again, we see the focus on performance, the ability to be super on point for the top sets, which there's nothing wrong with, but it's not the proper mindset for a bodybuilder because done properly with the way I just explained to you, 
a giant set will always allow you to follow up with the other movements. So, in his example, he says, I do squat, and if I superset the squat with a bunch of things that he described, I will not be able to do stiff legs. That is possible, you will be pre-fatigued. In this case, you could do strength work for the squat, then do stiff legs, and superset the stiff legs. But keep in mind that if you did what I told you with the squat, for some reason you decided to do squats and then roll darts and curls, you wouldn't be tired for the stiff leg. Why? Well, because you still only did squats for the lower body. So what would be fatigued is your overall workability and work capacity, but that's sort of the point. Giant sets are supposed to raise it. If curls and roll dart isolation are enough to poop you so that you can't follow up with your secondary sets, there is a problem. That problem needs to be fixed because bodybuilders are endurance. Bodybuilding is an endurance sport. Yes, we don't do 50 reps, but you're supposed to be able to do a lot of reps, recover from set reps, and keep going again and again. And the thing that I must mention is also the fact that, yes, in his example, he will be more performant on the squat, but compared to what I prescribe, he will have accumulated much less tonnage, and that is the flow of said method. So maybe you'll be slightly fresher for the stiff leg, but he will also have a ton of tonnage depth that he will not have done. And that is an issue because it is the point of giant set. As I said, yes, they condition you. He mentioned it, they're good for conditioning, but we disagree on what the conditioning aspect is. He speaks mainly about cardiovascular conditioning, I talk about muscular conditioning because giant sets build work capacity like nothing else. If you struggle to put in work, to recover from volume and to push your tonnage, giant sets start introducing them. There is a reason why I have you do supersets in my novice program. It's to get you there. It's to give you the ability to handle more work because this is what is going to promote growth. Intensity and pushing performance on main movements of course is important as well, but if it doesn't come with the ability to do more volume, at some point you are going to run into problems. I believe 100% that Paris is someone who knows these things, but because he prefers the performance aspect, he's not going to pay as much attention to them, and this is why he will say such things about giant sets. I also must mention that I am blind signing him, in the sense that I'm, of course, super prepared right now. You will see that I will correct this slight injustice at the conclusion of this video. But I also think that knowing the guy, knowing Paris, he's intelligent, he's well-educated, and he knows a ton about programming. I think that this is typically an answer of a Q&A he didn't spend much time thinking about. And because he sort of never did giant set himself, he is not 100% sharp on them. So in a sense, I'm not really attacking him. I'm attacking the stereotypes around the practice to, to criticize them and restore the truth, a truth that is very important for every bodybuilder because building the capacity to accumulate more tonnage overall is more important to bodybuilding than strength. You can quote me on that. It's very good that you're putting more pounds on your squat, but if you're completely neglecting other movements because of that, you are going to get in trouble. So many people have done that. They put all of their eggs in the compound movement basket of get stronger, then they look at their physique, they look like garbage. It's the starting strength problem. Paris doesn't program like this, I've, I've checked his programs, but the ideology around it is still similar. This is a direct quote from Paris. If you're looking to push the most amount of weight possible, which is important for strength or hypertrophy, again, this is a conflation, it's only important for strength as a, as a basic notion, because this is how you judge strength in its growth. This is not how you judge size. Yes, you're going to get stronger as you grow, as you develop your muscles, but this should never be your main goal. If progressive overload to you is summed up by more weight on the bar, you're going to have a tough time having a good physique. Some people get away with it. Some people can just focus on strength and they look tremendous. That's rare. These are outliers. The majority of the population will not work like this. The distinction in my head is simple. Strength training focuses on single movements and pushes them as far as possible so as to develop strength because it tests itself via this metric, while bodybuilding training concentrates on a variety of lifts to accumulate as much tonnage as possible. Both still aim to perform. I will never say the opposite. Of course, performance is important. And the two will still make you stronger because if you're a bodybuilder 
If your strength goes up, you can put more weight on the bar, do more reps with more weight, that's more tonnage. So yes, strength will help you gain size, but this is not the main metric and the strength gained will be at a completely different pace. So yes, Bold Omniman is correct. His method will have you progress on, progress on one lift faster. My method will have you progress on more lifts slower. Does that make sense? This is the difference in approach and the difference in the types of overload that must be pointed out. Parrish thinks that Giant sets damage performance because he's got what I call big mover mindset, something that is very typical with strength athletes, where they will always prioritize compound movements that, yes, will make you jacked, yes, will make you big, but are not enough for the average person. The average person has to focus on isolation as well. As basement bodybuilding would say, treat your accessories as priorities. Because if you don't, the muscles that you are supposed to isolate are going to become irrelevant because they're not given the priority that they deserve. And this is why I highly disagree with Paris's take on giant sets. It's because He's not taking isolation movements into account. Giant sets exist for isolation movements. But because he loves and hyper-focuses on compound movements, he does not want to see them being impaired by anything. So when he sees squats plus isolation plus isolation, he frowns because he thinks it's taking away from the squat and he's correct. But it's because he has no love for these isolations. Of course, I'm speaking in hyperboles to get you to understand. A bodybuilder will look at isolation and think, okay, they deserve to be there. They must absolutely be there. And if the compound movement suffers even a tiny bit, that is okay. Because I'm still getting my isolation work done. This is the proper mindset for someone who wishes to train for aesthetics. And this is why, by the way, giant sets exist. This is why I do them. This is why many people do them. It's because we have figured out at some point that we needed to give isolation the spot they deserved, but it would be a waste of time to open the training with them because of a performance aspect. And so we try to come up with the best of both worlds. Of course, you would never giant set several heavy compounds in a row because in this case, you would, you would commit a double sin. It's a sin against compounds, something that bold men would hate, and it's also a sin against isolations. So no one actually does that. We always, always complete giant sets with isolations. And it's especially true with lower body. I have tried to isolate lower body, uh, to, to giant set lower body movements. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. Use isolations instead. So now that the main uh, discussion is out of the way, I also want to mention Brian because... Uh, Paris mentions Brian Alsru, who is not necessarily the father of giant sets, but the man who popularized them the most on YouTube. I learned from him a ton, and the way he program programs, I think, is extremely advanced and relevant for bodybuilders, even though he is not a bodybuilder. So I sort of want to correct some of the mistakes that Paris committed, because I'm certain that he didn't do it on purpose, but he misrepresented the way Brian actually programs for giant sets, something that we've all done. I've done that in the past as well. It's not a sin, but for the sake of your education, I want to talk about it. So this is what Paris said about Brian's methods. And the gift and the curse of giant sets is you save a lot of time and you get fit. Absolutely. You run one of those dark horse programs by Brian Alsaru, you're going to get fit. But if you're looking to push the most amount of weight possible, which is important for strength or hypertrophy, not my, my, not my favorite. So, of course, it's a Q&A, and therefore, Bold Only Man wasn't super um, complete about his explanation. So, so, I just want to correct some mistakes and explain to you the way Brian actually programs his giant sets. So, usually, he has four exercises in the giant set, which all have a property. Usually, he starts with an explosive movement then a main mover, then core work, direct abdominal work, and then something called sweat, which is usually conditioning. This structure is not set in stone. It rotates. It's modifiable. Sometimes it's only three exercises. And you also find that if he programs upper body, he often opens with an horizontal pull followed by an horizontal press. The now famous row plus bench. This is also Brian who popularized that on YouTube. And it's an application of a superset that can become a giant set if you slap a third exercise after that. So this is the raw explanation of the way he programs. 
If you do not know who Brian is, I made a review of his program in the past. It's in the description because I believe that his dark horse program and template as a skeleton, not, a, not as a complete bodybuilding program, as a skeleton template is better than 90% of bodybuilding programs out there. He gets it. If you are not subscribed to his page, please go. You have a ton to learn from him, especially his older videos. This is where I owned my programming advice. And if you like my programs, you will like his approach as well. Now, this is not all. Brian is a strength athlete as well. And Bodom Omniman said that giant sets are not the best for performance and therefore also the best not the best for strength performance. And I think this is also a misrepresentation of the way Brian actually uh, functions. So in the example of Bold Omniman, he spoke about squats and hip hinges, like an explosive hip hinge, like a kettlebell swing. Brian would do the opposite. He would start with the kettlebell swing, but he would not do them to failure and he would not do them as work. It's not, it's not muscular failure. The goal is not to damage the muscle, to put tension on the muscle. The goal is to actually potentiate the muscle. It's to get the nerves and the body to fire. And then after that, you do your main mover like a deadlift, which does not take away from performance. It, the opening movement is just, again, to get the body in the right pathways. And this is absolutely applicable and does not damage your ability to deadlift a lot of weight, to squat a lot of weight. It would be different if you open, like I see many bodybuilders do, with a, a leg isolation, like a leg curl. Okay, in that case, it's work. You're damaging the ability of the glute and the arm strings to fire because you're tiring the muscle fibers. This is bad. This is why I'm against it. This is a bad way to giant set because the priorities aren't straight. But... If you do it properly like he does, you don't have to open with the compound movement. You can open with something like a kettlebell swing. And by doing that, as I said, he potentiates, he saves time, which is very important. And also he accumulates tonnage. And when I saw his method, I thought, okay, I don't care about the potentiation. I care about the saving time and I care about the tonnage. So how can I program to make use of giant sets for bodybuilding? Because... I use giant sets, but not in the way Brian does. I completely revamped the thing. I just took the skeleton of the brilliancy of the concept and I made something completely different with that. So the way I do it, my application, there's a million applications of giant set, is to open the set with a heavy compound movement, always, then palm it down in intensity. The goal is always to prioritize for performance the movement that requires the most uh, uh, nerve activation and the, more, the most muscle activation. So if someone opened with a curl, then follow that up with a press, I would say that it's a poor practice. But if you do a curl and a forearm exercise, now the priority is respected and the pyramid of intensities is also respected. You place at the start the motion that you want to be able to be the most performant on. And by doing that, you ensure that the movement that opens the giant set is always the one where you're the freshest. This is also something that Paris mentioned where he said, well, yes, you rest after the giant set, but you're not going to be as performant because of the exercises. And this is where I say, pardon my French, bogus, because you still rest. I don't care if you did exercises in between. You do a press, then curls, then forearms, then four minutes rest. You're going to be as fresh for your press as you would be if you didn't do the isolation. Please try it if you haven't. I know that it's tough to believe because we are used to top sets, single sets with only one movement, but if you give it a try, you will find that your performance is just as fresh. For example, start with a dumbbell press, then do skull crushers, then do abs or forearms. Pyramid of intensity is respected, you rest after the abs or forearms, then you do the dumbbell press. Performance is not affected, you will get as many reps as if you didn't do the exercises. And I know many people will say, well, that's not possible. You did skull crushers. If you do score crushes properly, it's an isolation movement for the long head. The dumbbell press does not recruit the long head. Again, don't trust me, try it. Give it a try. Do your overhead press and do a single set. And then try with the superset on a different session. And actually try. Don't send back on purpose. And you will find that you might need one week or two of adaptation because you have a weak work capacity. But beyond that, it's the same. You are just as performant. And the difference is that with my method, with the giant set method, you accumulate a shit ton of tonnage on top of that. The set I just presented to you is easy on cardio. And because the different muscles are worked, the performance is preserved. Now, I also want to nuance that by saying that, of course, 
Some people shouldn't be doing giant sets. It's not for everyone. It's the reason why you will not find giant sets in my novice programs beyond things like push-ups, abs, and calves because these are very easy movements on the cardio. And if you look at the program, they are arm wraps. There is a reason why it's because the performance aspect in the arm wrap is not that important. Trust me, when I program, I think about performance as well. I just don't think about it the way Bolt Omniman does. And it's because we're completely different people. So yes, giant sets can be tough for beginners and they're really not needed in the first place because as a beginner, you don't need that much volume and you don't have that many exercises in your rotation. You don't have that many variations. So you don't need that ability to save time and space. But the more you progress, the more you will need that. The more advanced you become, the more vital giant sets become. Because at some point, giving its own set to every lift becomes impossible. If I did this, I would be in the gym five hours. Can you, at this point, I can't even imagine it. Doing curls and then resting for three minutes? What is the point? There is no point. Super set, giant set, build up your work capacity. It is such a life saver. It's going to be so much more effective for you to be in the gym. And if you have a lift that you absolutely want to be pristine on, just don't super set this one. The rest you can. I know you don't care about your real delt. Even if you lose a rep, it's not the end of the wood. You get so much more back. You sacrifice on performance for one lift and you get more performance in total tonnage on other lifts. It is a match made in heaven for bodybuilders. The reason why someone like Paris doesn't do that is because he has a more minimalistic approach. And if you look at his physique, it fucking works. But it has its limits. And for many of you guys, you're going to reach these limits. You might be at a stage where his advice for now for hypertrophy is working flawlessly and on top of that you're getting strong as fuck in this case carry on what i don't want however is if the method stops working for you to just shrug your shoulders and say oh i have bad genetics or i don't know what i'm doing wrong you're not doing anything wrong and the methods you're following are not wrong they're just not tailored towards proper pure hypertrophy in this case you might actually want at this point to give giant sets a shot because minimalism prevents you from actually putting all of these muscle groups in the program. And I know that Paris has sort of changed his stance on some things, like for example, isolating the bicep or the abs, or even arm days, I'm not certain where he stands on this issue. But I know for a fact that he, he's, il met de l'eau dans son vin, he's putting water in his, in his wine. But he will always retain his performance-oriented mindset that that's perfectly normal and it needs to remain the same because his thing is most, most importantly strength and your body to be jacked as well, but that is the secondary pursuit. And therefore, uh, some things, again, that he says might be detrimental for pure hypertrophy, because if you don't do giant sets and you don't do supersets, good luck feeding abs, forearms, neck, calves, biceps, long end of the tricep, and all of the other small muscle groups in your program. If you have to give them a single set every single time, you won't be able to. And this is when the giant sets come into play. And this is when you can magnet these isolation movements to some of your compounds movements, and you will find that you don't lose performance. And again, you are going to gain on tonnage. Now, to conclude this video, the thing I want you to remember is that in this case, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong. First and foremost, because this is not drama. Voldemort is my brother and he is just someone who has a different approach. That's perfectly fine. What I want you to focus on instead is what's right or wrong for you. Because so many times subscribers get caught on these weird, stupid ego wars between influencers and they stop or they, they, they quit remembering that at, that at the start, you started following us for you, for your progress, for your results. If you get sucked in into a method you don't understand and doesn't serve you, what exactly is the point? Always think about your goals. Stop thinking about what the influencer wants you to be. Fuck the influencer. What do you want to be? Do you want to be jacked? Do you want to be strong? Do you want to be a strong man? Do you want to be a better swimmer? All of that is within you. But if you don't have goals and you don't have an objective in life, other people will find an objective for you. So make that step first and foremost. And once that is done, look at people that have similar goals. Listen to people that can help, that can best help you reach them. If you want to be strong, don't take advice from you, from me. I'm telling you right now, if your goal is strength, unless you're listening to me because you like hearing me speak for some reason, unsubscribe. Go subscribe to Alpha Destiny. Go subscribe to Bolt Omniman. They're much better at strength. I am a weakling and I don't care about strength. However, if you care about size, 
You have a pure bodybuilder right there who only does that. It's the one thing I do. So listen to what I say. Listen to GVS, Geoffrey Verity Schofield. He's also a pure bodybuilder. One day I will get him to admit he's a bodybuilder. Basement bodybuilding is a bodybuilder. Listen to him. It's the one thing we do. And surprise, surprise, our programming practices are pretty similar. Of course, there are small differences. But what we perceive to be important for size and the performance aspect is the same because we have pinpointed the aspect that needs to grow first and foremost. I call it tonnage. GVS might call it volume. It doesn't really matter. All of that is just a difference in lingo. You is, you is, <laughs> you are the most important part of the entire thing because at the end of the day, this is advice that is supposed to help you. And then, once you have selected the person that you want to listen to, you do the second most important thing, and that is to actually apply the advice. And this entire back and forth about giant set, there's no back and forth, it's just me talking to a camera. Uh, in this, in this one-man show of a giant set video, is it important if I'm right? Is it important if Bold Army Man is right? Absolutely not. What matters is, is it, does it serve you? So what I want you to do is, I want you to try Bold Army Man's approach, and I want you to try my approach. And tell me which one helps you best. And then select that. Who cares what is the truth? Who cares who is right? What matters is, is it right for you again? But the only way to do that is to actually apply it, which is going to actually falter all of the idiots that don't actually lift. If you are subscribed to our pages and you don't lift, you are wasting your life away. I don't understand what you're doing here. So that is something off my chest. It's important to say. Keep in mind that Taking whatever influencers say at face value is always going to backfire on you. And worst, you lose on the value they can bring into your life because you're not using your brain. Paris is a highly intelligent man. He has so much to offer to you. If you shut off your brain when he speaks and you just take it in, you're losing on things he can teach you. One of the most important things he says all the time is to bring it back to the body, to actually do it to your body, to not be the type of person that's just a pondexter that jokes himself off to theory. If you don't actually train, that's exactly what you are doing. So take this advice to heart and see for yourself if, if things function. Once you do that, you are going to be so much better off. All of that doubt about who should I follow? Follow you. Follow yourself. Follow your own path. Follow your own destiny. That is the only thing in life that is worth following because... Fitness influencers all have their own theories of what works. We all think we invented water. We all think that we're the best. We all think that all of our ideas are what needs to be followed. And at the end of the day, all of that is just a big dick measuring contest because what works and what doesn't is decided by you. And the only way to find value in this constant ideological battle is to develop your critical thinking skills. And to help assist you in that, I will be starting eventually a new podcast series in the format of a Socratic seminar where fitness YouTubers will be able to share their ideas in a format totally open to discussion and whose goal will be to reach a deeper understanding of training and the nuances between performance, size, and all of these great questions that I cannot wait to discuss. And I can already tell you that for my first guest, I am going to host bold omni man hopefully he's going to grace me with his presence we're going to have a great chat and after him more will follow i want to show to you guys what an actual discussion between adult men is supposed to look like not a debate between old ladies who bicker and want to prove they're right it's not about if you're right it's about what serves you best and a discussion something that leads to a better understanding of training for you is the way to go so I'm going to leave you with that. I hope this video helped you understand, again, the differences and things that work for you. And I'm going to see you very soon.